We've just come down to the lower ground floor where we have what I call History Corner. And what we've done, we've put together some uh, prints of the Arnhem campaign. Now, the connection to the Arnhem campaign of 1944 was that Stoke Rochford was the home of 2nd Battalion, the Parachute Regiment, immediately before they dropped into Holland. Now, we've got some uh, uh, David Shepherd prints of the bridge at Arnhem. And the actual picture depicts the bridge in the background. And in the foreground, we have some soldiers dug in in, in foxholes. And those represent the men from the 2nd Battalion, the Parachute Regiment. Of course, those are the boys who were stationed at Stoke Rochford before going off to Arnhem. Now, also coming across the bridge is a column of destroyed German vehicles. Now, the attack on the British forces was led by a gentleman called Grabner. Now, Grabner was uh, the uh, Beobachtens of Zier of 21st Panzer, and he was the reconnaissance commander uh, who assembled all his vehicles that he could lay his hands on, and the aim was to force the British troops off the bridge. Now, the attack came to nothing because, in part, we had managed to dig in a couple of six-pound anti-tank guns out of sight of the Germans. As they came across the uh, bridge, the guns opened fire, destroyed the lead elements, and then uh, subsequently destroyed the other vehicles in the column. But uh, interestingly, when they were uh, set up to engage the German troops, they found the guns were initially too high, and anything coming across the bridge, they would have been sat like a pea on a drum. So the Germans would have picked them off. So they dug the guns down out of sight. But when they dug the guns down, they found they didn't have a target. They couldn't actually see what they were shooting at. So they fired two solid shot anti-tank rounds at the parapet of the bridge and blew out a section of the concrete bridge, which gave them a gap they could then see through so that when the German vehicles came into view, they could shoot across the intervening gap and attack the, uh, the, the two vehicles. The other print we have is the crossroads at Oosterbeck. Now, Oosterbeck was the area where the paratroopers landed and the gliders landed, and the problem uh, that faced British intelligence was they did not believe they could get the gliders any closer to Arnhem Bridge than Oosterbeck because of the nature of the ground. If it was too soft, the gliders would dig in, go nose over tail, kill the crew and destroy the equipment inside. So they had to land away at Oosterbeck. Also, tragically, Oosterbeck was one of the areas where the British troops uh, found themselves engaged against the Germans. And if you can imagine a thumb-shaped pocket, with the base of the thumb being the River Rhine. And as the Germans are forcing our troops back, they're in this pocket being crushed further and further back towards the river. Well, one of the defensive perimeter points was at this village. And on the crossroads which ran through it, it was decided to employ two anti-tank guns, two six-pound anti-tank guns, to stop the German armoured thrust coming through into the Oosterbeck area. Well, the German tanks come into sight and our guns open fire on them. The Germans reply, destroy one gun and kill all the crew. They then attack the second gun. They kill or incapacitate all the other members of the crew, with the exception of one man, but he is very badly wounded in both legs by shrapnel. Undaunted, he carries on firing off all his remaining ammunition, and when he runs out of ammunition, he crawls across the road to the other gun, picks up a shell and goes to operate it, to find the gun has been destroyed. So he sticks the shell underneath his arm, limps back across the road, and uses the serviceable gun to carry on firing. He did that journey four times. On the fifth time, a mortar bomb lands practically on top of him, and he's killed. When the Germans come to bury him, he's buried as an unbecant, an unknown. But all his mates dug in around him knew exactly who he was. He was Lance Sergeant Baskefield, aged 22, Victoria Cross. Inspired by Baskefield, I looked at the other Victoria Cross winners of the Arnhem campaign. There were a total of five. And the other four, the first of which was a chap called Lionel Querypel. Now, Query Powell was a company commander. Uh, one of his jobs was to force his way up the uh, roads to relieve the boys from two power on the bridge. He came across all sorts of obstacles and problems that the Germans had thrown across their way. 
As they're advancing up the road with his 120 men, they're under constant artillery, mortar and machine gun fire, and after a short period of time, his men have been reduced to 60. One of uh, the young chaps with him, a sergeant, is shot by the Germans, so Quayopel stops to pick him up uh, with the aid of getting him to a dressing station. As he picks the chap up, he's shot in the face by a sniper and part of his jaw is blown away. He then returns to the dressing station and delivers the injured sergeant, refuses medical treatment himself and goes back to leading his troops. He continues up the road towards the Arnhem Bridge, leading his uh, ever-dwindling band of men, where they then come across uh, a six-pounder anti-tank gun, which has been captured by the Germans, which is our own gun, and it's being employed against us. The Germans, to hold this strong point, also deploy two machine guns. So, what does Query Pell do? He grabs the available hand grenades and a machine gun and then assaults the German strong point single-handedly, wipes out the two machine gun crews and captures back the British gun. This is a temporary halt to his uh, activity, so he carries on up the road with, uh, again, more casualties being inflicted on his dwindling band until they eventually end up in a slit trench, down to about 15 men. Whilst they're holding this piece of ground, he comes to the decision that it's time for his boys to try and break out. So he orders his men to go to the rear, make for the Rhine, and to fight another day. To hold the ground, he takes all their available hand grenades and ammunition, and single-handedly defended that trench, we think, for about four hours, until finally overrun, and he was killed by the German attack. Our next VC is a gentleman called Greyburn. Now, Greyburn's one of ours because he was two para. Inspirational young officer. And he was uh, responsible for leading the initial attacks across the bridge to try and secure the bridge for the British forces. And one of the activities he gets up to, he climbs into the top of the metalwork of the bridge because with the, the curve of the bridge, the troops couldn't see on one side what's happening on the other. So he goes up into the metalwork and is calling down instructions to his troops so that they knew where to drop mortar bombs or to be prepared for the next onrush from the Germans. So, unfortunately, a sniper shoots him dead and he falls from the parapet of the bridge into the River Rhine. Miraculously, in 1948, as the Dutch are tidying up Arnhem, his body is recovered from the River Rhine and he is afforded a proper Christian burial and his gravestone can now be seen at Oosterbeck Military Cemetery, slightly apart from the rest of his men who were killed in 1944. We have a nice photograph here showing the officers of the 2nd Battalion sat outside the front of uh, Stoke Rochford Hall, which was taken on the 15th of September 1944, just two days before they dropped. In the centre is Colonel Johnny Frost, wearing his uh, regimental Scottish trousers, his thews. Another Victoria Cross winner was Henry or Harry Kane. Now, Harry Kane was the only surviving uh, Victoria Cross winner of the Arnhem campaign, and he was a remarkable man. He was advancing towards the bridge with his troops, and they came under attack by the Germans. So... He decided that um, when they were engaged by tanks, he would do something about this. So he picked up a particular weapon called a Piat, which is a projector infantry anti-tank. Now, we're all familiar with the bazooka, but this uh, particular weapon didn't have a rocket motor on the bomb. It was basically a big spring which launched the bomb in the general direction of the vehicle coming towards it. So what does he do? This guy stands in the middle of the road with his pit as the German tank is bearing down on him, fires a pit, the first round ricochets off the glacis plate, so calmly, in the face of the enemy tank, he reloads and fires again. The German tank doesn't like the idea of being shot at by uh, Henry Kane, and it machine guns him and he's wounded in both arms by machine gun bullets. However, he fires a pit, hits the German vehicle and destroys it. Also, Henry Kane has had a magnificent television programme made about him by Jeremy Clarkson, the television presenter, because Clarkson married his daughter. And Clarkson never knew he was a Victoria Cross holder until after his death, 
So he decided he would make this TV show in memory of his um, father-in-law. Last but not least of the Victoria Cross winners was uh, Flight Lieutenant David Lord. David Lord was the captain of a Dakota aircraft, and that's a resupply aeroplane, and laden with stores to bring uh, food and ammunition to the boys on the ground at Arnhem. Unfortunately, in the early part of the Arnhem campaign, the Germans captured intact our top-secret documents showing the routes the resupply aircraft would be flying in, where the drop zones were, and the timings of, uh, of our airlift. All they had to do was line up their flat guns and wait for our aircraft to arrive like so many clay pigeons on a shooting gallery. David Lord was flying his aircraft to bring those stores to the boys on the ground who needed them and he runs into a belt of flak. His aircraft is set on fire and he orders his crew to bail out. He carries on flying his aircraft to the drop zones. When he looks out of the window of the aircraft at the appointed drop zone, he sees that it has already been overrun by the Germans. Therefore, if he was to release his stores now, they would go straight into German hands. Undaunted, he carries on flying until he can positively identify British troops on the ground, whereby he then releases the stores to them. As he's pulling away, the aircraft explodes and he is killed. He was the only... Royal Air Force Air Transport Command Victoria Cross of the War. And as a mark of respect, the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight had painted their Dakota in the colours of his aircraft. One day I received a telephone call from the gardeners saying, We've just dug up a load of ammunition in the ground. Oh, great, say I. So I put my health and safety hat on and go down to uh, see what we've got. And it's all 303 ammunition. Now that's the same size calibre as the infantry rifle would have been used by the parachute regiment. So I think to myself, this is something the airborne boys have left behind they didn't want to carry. So we start excavating out of the ground and putting it in a bucket for the police to take away, and then suddenly we find lots of chunks of aluminium. I then know we have an aircraft. But Lincolnshire being a huge aircraft carrier during World War II, the aeroplane could have been almost anything. But... It was a fair bet it was a bomber, because Lincolnshire being Bomber County. But then that didn't narrow it down any more, because it could have been a Manchester, Lancaster, Stirling, Halifax, Blenheim. The list goes on. So I thought, I'll get on the internet and search for every available piece of information on the wartime history of Stoke Rochford. Well, I got one hit from Canada, and that hit said... Air Force Base Trenton closed by bomb scare. So I thought, what on earth has that got to do with Stoke Rochford? So as I scrolled down through the article, it came out that somebody walking the grounds of Stoke Rochford had found a little bracelet, a bit like the uh, diabetic bracelets people wear today. On one side of it was a Royal Canadian Air Force cap badge, and on the other side was an engraving saying, To Verl Edmund Klein, Love Marge. I've now got a name. I pop uh, Verl's name into the Commonwealth Wargrave search engine and up he pops 21-year-old air gunner killed on the 28th of April 1945, just 10 days before the end of the war. Armed with Klein's date of death, I can then approach the Air Force Museum at Hendon. They're extremely helpful and they come back and say that he was killed along with six other men. This now tells me we have a heavy bomber. But most importantly, they gave me the name of the pilot, Norman William Guy, aged 24. As I have the pilot's name, I can now approach the Royal Air Force Air Historical Branch at the Ministry of Defence and give them the information I have. They were extremely helpful. They came back and reported the aircraft was a Lancaster bomber, serial number Lima Mike 719, squadron code letters Hotel 4, a 1653 heavy conversion unit, and the individual aircraft call sign was M for Mother. Oh, and by the way, they said, would you like a copy of the Board of Inquiry report? They had everything. I could even tell you the date the engines were serviced before it crashed. Well, the circumstances behind the crash was that the the aircraft came down in appalling weather. It had taken off on a training sortie in a rainstorm. That rainstorm deteriorated into a thunderstorm and snowstorm. They were flying, attempting to find a way back to North Luffenham, their base, when uh, they were flying in this appalling weather. 
As the aircraft passed over Colsterworth, an eyewitness reports that one of the engines was on fire. In the few mile distance to Stoke Rochford, the whole wing was ablaze. The aircraft then crashed in the grounds of Stoke Rochford Hall, and all seven men were killed. The information the Royal Air Force gave me enabled us to put together the last moments of that aircraft crash. The crew, as I say, flying in appalling weather, off course, desperately trying to find their base. Unfortunately, things conspired against them. We will never know what caused the fire. It may be speculated they were either struck by lightning or the engine seized up because of the, um, the, the snow. Either way, it led to an in, a wing fire which caused the aircraft to crash at Stoke Rochford Hall. The Royal Air Force removed the majority of the wreckage and the bodies at the time of the crash, but this left a few uh, bits and pieces uh, still in the ground, which uh, we had started to recover. The few bits and pieces amounted to several carrier bag fulls of aluminium. So I decided that uh, the thing to do with this aluminium was to cast it up as a plaque and then get it engraved with the names of the aircrew who had perished. So Royal Air Force Cottesmore very kindly cast that up for me, engraved it, and once we had the plaque made, I thought a uh, fitting tribute would be a Canadian maple tree to go adjacent to the plaque, as the aircrew were six Canadians and one Englishman on board. Well, I had my plaque, had my tree. I then thought to myself, well, this needs dedicating in some way. So I contacted the Royal Canadian Air Force at the Canadian High Commission down in London and invited them to come along and lay a wreath on the plaque. They were very happy to do this and they and their, their uh, wives came along to this. And I also persuaded the uh, colonel to try and trace any family members of the air crew who had been killed with a view of uh, contacting them so we could let them know that a plaque had been put up in memory of their lost ones. Well, it all started to grow like topsy from there because uh, the Canadian government got hold of the relatives. They duly contacted me. And at this point, I contacted the Royal Air Force and said, can you give us some help? And they gave me a padre, a trumpeter, and a colour party to come along to honour this uh, air crew. And we also managed to get hold of 22 standards from the Royal British Legion, Royal Air Forces Association, and regimental associations uh, to uh, come along uh, to parade. And the word was out by now, 200 local people attended. So we had our ceremony, and the absolute icing on the cake was the Canadian families were brought over to celebrate the day. Whilst uh, having the privilege of meeting the Canadian families, they told me a few details of the individual crews. And uh, one of the stories which came out was, as a crew, they'd all gone on leave to Scotland. And each man had purchased a piece of tartan embroidered Flay Bonnie Scotland. And each man had then sent it off to his relatives over in Canada. A nice tale, and I thought no more about it. Eighteen months later, completely out of the blue, I receive an email from a lady saying, My name is Aileen Murphy. My maiden name was Travis. As a child, I was never told what had happened to my brother, but he was killed while serving on Lancaster's during the war. I was doing some private research and I discovered you have a plaque at Stoke Rochford Hall and the name of the wireless operator is Travis. This is my brother's service number. Could you please compare it to your records to see if it is my brother? And it was. I was able to send her all the photographs, to tell her all about the ceremony and how we had honoured the crew which had uh, died at Stoke Rochford. And she said she would agree to come over to UK and she came over just about a couple of years ago now, and I met her, took her to the crash site, told her where her brother was buried down in Brookwood in um, Surrey, and uh, gave her the information on the other families who had lost people on board the aircraft. She went home to find she lived two hours up the road from a lady who rejoices in the name of Vesper Merritt. Now, Vesper Merritt was the sister of Verl Edmund Klein, the boy who starts the whole story off. Well, these two old girls get together over a pot of coffee and they both have a piece of tartan embroidered for a bonnie Scotland. So Aileen's is out on the table, all flat, 
and uh, Vespa then produces her piece of tartan, and it's all folded up. As she unfolds the piece of tartan, inside is a signet ring. And at this point, Aileen says, Where did you get that ring? Vespa replies, Well, it came back with his personal effects. Aileen then replies, Well, it's not your brother's ring. It's my brother's ring, and I can prove it, because it's his alumni motto around the edge of it. Well, it appears that uh, the uh, ring was sent completely by accident to the wrong family. Um, what we think may have happened is complete speculation, but what we think may have happened, Travis was getting kitted up to go flying. He couldn't put his gauntlets on over the bulky ring, slipped it off, threw it in the crew locker or into Verl Klein's locker and said, I'll get that when we get back. And of course, they never came home. So in all honesty, the service police would have bagged up the personal effects and sent it completely by accident to the wrong family. Well, 65 years to the date of the, on the date of the anniversary of his death, the ring was repatriated to the correct family at Canadian Air Force Base Trenton, all as a result of the Stoke Rochford research. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.